الحمد للإله سابغ النعم وخالق الإنسان من بعد العدم فالحمد ثم الحمد ثم الحمد لك حمدا كثيرا طيبا يا رب لك أعطيتنا خيرا كثيرا ربنا سترت عن كل الورى عيوبنا ثم الصلاة بعد والتسليم على النبي المصطفى الكريم السلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ونوله أما بعد <coughs> الحمد لله uh, we've gathered here today uh, as you all know to do a brief Hajj class and this is um, obviously not the time or the place to give a detailed discussion because that's something that will require many many days of lecturing uh, and so what I'm going to do is just give a very brief overview and summary and then open the floor for questions because I'm sure for those of you who are going for Hajj you have done the research that you need to uh, and it's not the time we, uh, to do an actual fiqh class of Hajj will take us many weeks and also uh, Hajj is a very complicated ritual it's not an easy ritual and theory is one thing and practice is another Theory is one thing and reality is another. So I can give you a nutshell, the theory, but what's going to happen in your particular hajj? There's a million and one scenarios, right? Your bus was late, you missed this, you had to do that, you weren't able to walk here, the, the rami was done at a different time. We cannot possibly cover all of the hypothetical scenarios that is going to happen. And therefore, uh, the first piece of practical advice, and I'm going to give some practical advice, the first piece of practical advice Choose your religious authority from now. Who do you trust to ask for fatwa? Who are you going to ask when something goes wrong? Make sure you are confident in that person. Because your hajj is going to really depend on, on who you're going to ask for your confusion. If you don't know what you're doing, you need to call up and you need to ask some fatwa. Have some authority that you trust. Some hajj groups have a muallim. Most of them have some type of spiritual guide. Fact of the matter is, many of them are not, you know, I mean, they're, as you know, the state of the ummah, our religious clergy is sometimes not qualified to do what they're doing. So you need to make up your mind who is the authority that you trust, and then stick with that authority. Uh, if you're happy with the guide that's with your package, alhamdulillah. If not, then find out somebody that you can contact. I'm not unfortunately going for hajj, so I'm not the best person. I, I wish I could be your, 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 your ma'alim, but I'm you know, 2,000 miles away in Memphis. You might need something instantaneously answered. So find out, and believe me, there's plenty of people there. Um, generally speaking, it's not a problem. I, I would encourage you to also avail yourself to the fatwa boots. There are fatwa boots set up everywhere says questions, fatwas, and there are scholars there that are appointed by the government with translators in every language, Arabic, English, Urdu, of course they speak Arabic as a mother language. Um, uh, it's, uh, these are the people that are going to, they're experienced, they know what they're talking about, uh, and I would encourage you, if you cannot find anybody, to, to uh, encourage yourself, avail yourself to that opportunity. So, inshallah, in a nutshell, we'll cover Hajj, and then we'll open the floor for questions, comments, and concerns. Hajj, as we all know, is the fifth pillar of Islam, and it is an obligation, and that's something that, alhamdulillah, all of you are familiar with. And it is the last obligation that Allah revealed of the arkan. It is the last of the five arkan, not just in order, but in chron chron uh, chronological wujub. Allah revealed firstly the, f the fast, the, the prayer, and then He revealed the fasting, and then He revealed the zakat, and then the final obligation that He revealed is the, reveal is the revelation of Hajj. And Hajj is obligatory with two conditions, physical capability and financial uh, surplus. You need to be physically capable. If you're incapacitated, if you don't have a mahram, you're not physically capable of doing hajj. You need to be physically capable, number one. Number two, you need to have the finances. And finances, uh, again, it's a question of fiqh. How much finances do you need? The response is enough for you to do a hajj that is comfortable for your socioeconomic level. If you're middle class, then you expect to go on a middle class hajj, right? And therefore, you need to have in our times at least, what is the average, four or five thousand dollars or even more these days? You know, four, five, six thousand. I mean, this is what it used to be. Even ten years ago, it used to be two thousand. But prices are going up. So Allah does not require that you go like a beggar if you live a middle class life in America. It's understood that as a middle class person, you will go on a middle class package, so you need to save up for what is the equivalent of five, six thousand years, uh, years, <laughs> uh, dollars. If by that time you save up, the prices go up, you don't have to sacrifice and go on the bare bottom package because this is you're going at your level, right? Now, if you're saving up for the luxury package and you're not capable or worthy of that, this is Israf. This is Israf. You know your level. 
you know what is reasonable for you, and you look at the package, if it's a three-star hotel, which is a middle class, what we would expect, then this is the package you go for. If you are, mashallah, uh, earning yani, mashallah, a lot of money and you expect to go in that package, then that's a different story, the five-star package. Otherwise, for most Muslims, we go for the average Hajj route, which is around five, six thousand dollars in our times. Now, uh, Hajj, there are three types of Hajj. And I'm only going to concentrate on the one that's the most common. The three types of Hajj are, number one, Tamattu'. Number two, Qiran. Number three, Ifrad. Once again, Tamattu', Qiran, and Ifrad. What are these three types? It's how you combine Umrah with Hajj. This is how the relationship comes. There are three logical possibilities. Number one, you don't do Umrah at all. And that's Ifrad. Ifrad from Fard, singular. There's no Umrah. You just go for the Hajj. Number two, you do Umrah and Hajj in one Ihram. You don't get out of Ihram. And this is Qiran. You have joined the two. Qiran, you have Qiran. You have joined the two. Number three, and this is the most common for foreigners who don't live in Saudi Arabia. And also, it is the most rewarding. It is that you do a full Hajj and a full Umrah with two Ihrams. So you do the full Hajj and Umrah. With, with You get out of ihram in the middle. And this is the best because it is two acts in one. You do the umrah and then you do the hajj. And this is what most people do because they're going only one time in their life. So they want to do the hajj, they want to do the umrah. Right? So once again, if you only do the hajj, this is ifrad. And that's the quickest, shortest, easiest. It's also the cheapest because you don't have to pay the qurbani. Right? Uh, number, ifrad is singular. Hajj. That's what I said, right? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I might have said that's number three, but I mean, I'm saying ifrad is the term. Ifrad is singular hajj, right? Another type of hajj is qiran, which you've combined the two together. And in qiran, as we said, you do hajj and umrah in one ihram. You don't get out of ihram. And the most common type, and that's the type I'm going to be talking about, that's the type that the bulk of the world that goes out from abroad and comes from abroad does, is tamattu. And tamattu is also the most rewarding, and tamattu is also uh, the most actions in it, and that's why it's the most rewarding. And tamattu is the full umrah, then you get out of umrah, and then you wait for the days of hajj, and then you do the full hajj. So tamattu means enjoyment. It is called enjoyment because you enjoy getting out of ihram. There's a period of enjoyment. Because in ihram, you cannot cut your nails, shave your hair, uh, enjoy your wife, etc. Out of ihram, all of this is permissible. So, tamattu' means you did the umrah, then you got out of ihram. You finished, khalas, now you're done. Now you have five days, one week, ten days, however many days. For some people, that can even be one month, two months. They're in the state of enjoyment. If they come in shawwal, uh, and they come after Ramadan, they're going to wait all the way till, uh, till uh, Dhul Qa'idah, uh, Dhul Hijjah, until they do it. So, of course, for us in America, we cannot have that luxury. It's only five days, two days, one day. But Tamattu' means you enjoy in the middle. And that's why it's called Tamattu'. So, we're going to talk about Tamattu'. We're not going to do the other two. If you're doing the other two, then come to me later or speak to me afterwards. Uh, but we're going to talk about Tamattu' because that's what 90% of the world does. And that is what they should do if it's the first Hajj they're going for. The first thing that we need to understand is that Hajj must occur at a particular place, in a particular time, and a particular state of Ihram. Place, time, and spiritual state are all important. Not like Salah, you can pray anywhere. Not like Dua, you can do it in any state. Hajj is a particular place. It has to be in Makkah, Mina, Muzdalifah, Arafat, understood. Has to be at a particular time, right? And for the Hajj acts, it must be on the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th of Dhul Hijjah. You cannot do it on any other day. And it must be in a particular state, and that state is called Ihram, right? So Hajj is a very specific act, particular place, time, and state. So, what is the Ihram? The Ihram is a state in which you declare certain things that are halal, you declare them haram, and that's why it's called Ihram. You have made certain things that are otherwise halal, you have made them haram upon yourself. And so the ihram is a sacred state that you enter and you declare in front of Allah, I am doing hajj. So I'm entering the state of ihram. Now where is the ihram entered into? 
It is entered into in the Mawaqit or the Miqat. The Miqat. The Miqat, geographic locations, the Prophet specified five locations. He specified five locations. Our scholars have taken those five and drawn lines between them. Right? And so the Ihram has become a boundary because of these five locations. These are specifically mentioned in the Hadith and then our modern scholars, in fact even in the old, they, they drew boundaries. You don't have to go to one of these five, but these are the boundaries that are made by the five. Right? And so when you cross the boundary, you must at that point or before it, it's permissible to go before it, declare ihram. You cannot pass the miqat without declaring ihram or else you have to pay a penalty. Right? So you have to declare the ihram at or before the miqat. Why do I say before? Because when you're going on a plane, you don't have to wait exactly at the minute because you're not going to know. It is safer to declare your ihram 10 minutes, 5 minutes before you think you're going to enter it and you are safe. Okay, because you can enter ihram before the miqat. If you pass the miqat, this is a penalty. You have to give a, a fidya, which we'll talk about later on. So, we don't have to worry about uh, telling you what the miqat are. Any plane you take, your miqat, you're going to land in Jeddah, right? I don't think anybody's landing in Riyadh every day. Almost 99% land in Jeddah. So realize that the miqat is five minutes before you land. Five minutes before you land is the miqat. That's all you need to know. Therefore, it is safest to enter into ihram 10 minutes before you land. Not a problem if it's 15 minutes because it doesn't matter. You can enter a miqat even from America, but you're making life difficult, right? So, you enter into ihram 10 minutes before you land, you're on the safe side, right? In fact, the miqat is literally right outside of Jeddah. If somebody were to say 2 minutes before you land, 3 minutes before you land, this would also have an element of truth because the miqat is literally outside of Jeddah. What you cannot do is land in Jeddah and then say, Labbaik Allahumma Hajj. No. Now you're in trouble and you have to pay a penalty. You cannot wait for the plane to land. You have to enter the miqat uh, and declare the talbiyah before the state of the, uh, before you land in Jeddah. Now, entering the ihram is simply a verbal act. It is a verbal act. You say, Labbaik Allahumma Hajj. This is your ihram. Whether you're wearing the ihram or not is a separate point. So if it so happens, some people are not wearing the ihram, the big mistake. But when they enter into it, they have to say, Labbaik Allahumma Hajj. Even if they're wearing pant and shirt. Then they pay the penalty for the pant and shirt, but they're safe that they've entered ihram. Right? Please don't get confused. Ihram is not the garment you're wearing. Ihram is the declaration. Labbaik Allahumma Hajj. Right? Or, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ Whatever, you're saying لَبَّيْكَ Or you can even say نَوَيْتُ حَجًّا Or you can say in English, my niyyah is for hajj. But you need to say something to enter into ihram. And that is said before the miqat. So far so clear? We're all on the same page? Now, of course, you know you're going to enter into ihram before landing in Jeddah. Therefore, it's common sense that you wear the garments for the men, you wear the garments before you land in Jeddah. If you're stopping over in Dubai or in Frankfurt, believe me, it's not going to be embarrassing because half the world is going for Hajj at that time. So everybody in the plane is going to be wearing ihram. You don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Um, you know what? Go ahead. Ask the questions. No, not a problem. The question was: If you're you access like you make uh, ihram and you're not wearing the ihram, what's the difference? Uh, so, if you make the ihram. While you're not wearing ihram, the fidya is the same as cutting your hair off or wearing clothes. And that is to uh, fast three days or to feed six people or to give a sacrifice. And we'll talk about that in a while. Right? So the fidya is relatively trivial. Whereas if you were to not enter ihram, now you're in big trouble. And you have to go back. That's the best thing to do. Or you have to give a badana or a camel or something or a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. No, you don't have to. You don't have to mention what type of Hajj, and you're allowed to change your mind within the Hajj. Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, shows his intelligence when he did the labbaik. He didn't know how the Prophet was doing Hajj, so he said, "What type of Hajj?" He didn't know, so he said, "Labbaik Allahumma upon the Hajj of the Prophet whatever that is." Very smart. However the Prophet was doing, that's my hajj. Because he was coming from Yemen, and the Prophet was coming from Medina, and so it doesn't matter. Even if you change your mind, 
from, from ifrad to tamattu, you change your mind before you begin, not a problem. Because once you've entered, it's just like nafil prayer, not fard, nafil prayer. If you pray, wanted to pray two rakat uh, for one reason, and then you change your mind in the middle for nafil, no, it's allowed. Not for fard, it's not allowed. So for hajj, whatever you do, it's permissible within that framework. Yes? You have to verbalize the niyyah. And verbalizing is done by any way. The only place in the sharia where the niyyah is verbal is hajj. Not in salah, not in anything else. The only place where the niyyah must be verbal is the hajj. Now, what is the verbalization? It is any expression that signifies hajj. You can say in English, Oh Allah, I am doing the hajj. This is your niyyah. You can say labbaik Allahumma labbaik, this is your niyyah. You can say labbaik Allahumma hajj, labbaik Allahumma tamattu' anything but you have to say it. Now, I wouldn't worry too much because the whole plane is going to be eagerly looking at their watch and this and that, so you're with a group. So I wouldn't worry too much about you forgetting the entire plane is a hajj plane and everybody's waiting and people are going to be doing it from the beginning all the way to Jeddah. Don't worry about that, inshaAllah ta'ala, plus you have a time frame. Like I said, I would personally, I would do it 15 minutes before the plane lands. Even if you did it 3 minutes before the plane lands, and the pilot will make an announcement. Almost all airplanes, they may, will make an announcement that we are, we are going to pass the miqat in 2 minutes or something like this. So when they make this announcement, and even if they don't, 10 minutes before they land, you should say something. If you don't verbalize, you haven't made the niyyah. And therefore there's the penalty if you land in Jeddah. Okay? Now... So if you're landing in Medina, that's then you're then you're safe because Medina is outside of Ihram. But I, in America, I don't know. If planes don't go. There are, there are a few. Okay, it's rare. Uh, from what I remember, American groups, almost all of them, they go to Jeddah first. Some groups from Egypt and from Jordan. There's direct flights to Medina. Aha, Jordan, exactly. Yeah. So if it's Jordan, and then they're going to Medina, then you're not entering Ihram anyway because Medina is outside of. Of the, the miqat, right? So if you're not entering the ihram, then you don't have to worry about this. Then you're going to enter ihram from Medina when the bus leaves. They're going to stop at the place of ihram. And then you're going to enter the ihram there. Uh, now, what is prohibited in ihram? Nine things. Nine things are prohibited in ihram. We'll go over them one by one. Number one, cutting or shaving the hair. Cutting or shaving the hair. I have to point out here that a lot of people make Islam more difficult than it is. And so if you're going to trust me, trust me in what I say. If you're not, then go trust the person that you're going to trust for Islamic fatwas. But if you're coming here to this class, I'm assuming you're going to trust me. Please understand that a lot of the books and a lot of the people out there, they make our religion more difficult and it's not that difficult. I mean, I don't know how to say I have done Hajj, alhamdulillah, more than 10 times. I have studied these rulings inside out. And what I'm teaching you is basically the fatawa, the fatawa you're going to hear from those fatwa boxes and boots. This is the mainstream fatwa of those who are doing Hajj every year and they're more familiar with it. You know when you're far away and you've never done Hajj, it's easier to make things more difficult even as a scholar. And this is what we found many of the scholars did. That they've never done Hajj and because they don't understand, they don't visualize, they might make things more difficult. Those who do Hajj regularly and they understand the evidences make it a little bit easier. So, what do I mean by all of this? What is prohibited is to intentionally pluck your hair or to trim it or to shave it. If your hair accidentally falls off, you didn't do it. Don't worry about it. Right? Also, it is not haram to comb your hair. It is not. There's no prohibition in, against combing. The prohibition is against shaving, plucking, trimming. So it is understood, especially when you're older and your ear years, such as myself these days, when you comb your hair, something's going to fall. Right? That didn't happen 10 years ago with me. <laughs> now it is happening. Okay? This does not constitute plucking the hair. Because your intention was to comb. And it is permitted for men and for women to comb. I said it is permitted. It's not encouraged, but it is allowed. There's no penalty if when you comb your hair, some hair falls off. Similarly, there's no penalty if you wake up and your pillow has some hair fallen down. You didn't do it. It's nothing at all. If you were intentionally did it, this is where you need to pay the fidya. So we'll get to the fidya. Number one, we said shaving, trimming, cutting the hair. Number two, cutting the nails. 
Once again, intentionally cutting the nails. If, and this happens to me all the time, your nail scrapes against something and it bends, right? Because you're in the state of ihram for a week, your nails are going to grow. If they're going to grow, it's going to chip away. Again, if you have, if it's, even if it's chipped away and it's painful to you or it's awkward, you may break the chip without breaking the whole nail. Right? Do you understand this point? Little bit of nail. You didn't intend to break the nail. There is no fidya. This is your hands grazed against something, cement or something, and it happens all the time, right? Or you pick something up, you have big nails, and it, it, it cracked. You didn't intentionally crack or break the nail, no fidya on you. What is not allowed, if you take the nail clippers or your teeth, or you know, some people you know, bite their nails or whatever, that would not be allowed. And again, this is intentional. Unintentional, everything that is done unintentionally is forgiven anyway. The sharia has this, right? رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَخِذْنَا Anything that is unintentional. So even if you were just trimming, uh, you know, or pulling your beard like this, or pulling your hair, some people have a habit of, you know, doing this, and then you realize, oh, a, a, a hair came out. You didn't intend to do that, right? And therefore, this is forgiven. Of course, you should be conscious, but it's forgiven. There's no fidya on you. So number two, we said trimming the nails. Number three, now, by the way, I need to understand, explain to you the psychology. Why does Allah... Tell men and women, this is for both men and women so far, to uh, not trim their nails and their hair, to remind them that there is a greater goal, that they shouldn't be worried about vanity, looking pretty and looking beautiful, that there's a bigger goal. That, you know, at times of distress, like imagine somebody whose loved one has died. Do you think they're going to be worried about grooming themselves and trimming the... You know, it's something big happening, right? So Allah is telling you, this is your qiyamah now, right? This is, imagine qiyamah day, right? Imagine you have something to... You should have bigger things on your mind than making sure you're looking all pretty and vain, glorious, and looking at the window, a mirror, looking at, you know, looking at your image. No, there's bigger things to worry about. So Allah wants us intentionally to feel that we have bigger things to worry about. And so he's made these things prohibited without making the more uh, bigger things, such as ghusl, such as washing yourself in the bathroom. Of course, you need to do that, right? So Allah has prohibited the finer things of life and not uh, the staple items of life. So number two is trimming the nails. Number three, for men only, covering the hair. Now, especially in the old days, covering the hair was a sign of Modesty for men. It was a sign of dignity, right? Even in America, look at uh, any black and white movie, what are all the men have their caps on? And to remove the hair covering was a sign of humility. Free men did not have their hair uncovered. Only slaves did. And this is, by the way, even in Islamic lands. Free men didn't have this. This is culture. In our times, everybody, myself, all of you, all of us are, have our hair uncovered. This is culture. So the purpose here was to signify your servitude to Allah. That nobody had their hair uncovered except a slave. In Hajj, all of us are Allah's slaves. So we were all supposed to have the hair uncovered. And therefore, to cover the hair with a connected garment such as a cap, such as a ball cap, such as a turban. This is something that is not allowed. However, to have shade and shelter, the Prophet ﷺ, Bilal would cover him with the sun, with his own ihram. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ sat under a tree. So there is one group, different firqa, they believe that you cannot have any covering between you and Allah. So their buses are all, they have no covering on the buses. Their tents have nothing on top. This is that firqa. This is not Sunnism. This is the other firqa. For us, we can sit in shade. The Prophet them sat in shade. You can cover yourself with an umbrella. You can cover yourself with the sun, with something that's not connected. But you cannot have a connected covering on the head. Uh, you had a question with this? When you're sleeping, sometimes the comfort you that also. When you're sleeping, the pen has been lifted from you. You don't intentionally put it on you. But if you're sleeping and you just put it on in, in your sleep, and you wake up, when you wake up, you take it off. You didn't intentionally put it on you. Number four. Number four. And this is also for men only. And this is the biggest confusion amongst men. 
it says you're not supposed to wear unsewn or, or un, you're supposed to wear unsewn or unstitched garments, right? This is for men. Now, people don't understand what unsewn or unstitched means, and they think that unsewn and unstitched means you cannot have any needlework on it. This is completely wrong. And the translation is wrong as well. What is forbidden is for men to wear a garment that wraps around the limbs. This is what unstitched means. Such as my shirt. Just as a jacket that has hands, uh, you know, for sleeves in it. Such as a pant, slacks, jeans, undergarments, underwear. These are sewn. Your ihram has needlework on it. That's not, that's not a problem, right? A jacket. If you were to wear a jacket in the cold weather without putting your sleeves in, this is an unsewn garment because you're using it as a shawl. You guys following me? If I have a jacket, you put it on over you without putting your hands inside, you're safe. You're scot-free because you're not using it as a stitched garment. What is a stitched garment? A garment that covers the limbs. What is the limbs? The two hands and the feet, right? And therefore, pants are not allowed but you cover yourself with that, uh, uh, with the ihram. Shirts are not allowed, but you cover the upper part of a garment with something that wraps around. It doesn't have to be white, it doesn't have to be a rectangle, but of course it's the most convenient that it is shaped that way. And of course white is the most beloved cover, color to the Prophet So that is why all ihrams are white, and that is why they're shaped in that rectangle. But the meaning of unstitched is that you don't have uh, leggings and and sleeves. This is what it means unstitched. And therefore, as I said, if you were to wear something as a shawl, even if that garment has leggings and sleeves, you're fine. Because you didn't use it as that, you used it as a wraparound. So the point being for men only, they need to wrap things around them. And they cannot wear stitched garments. So this is point number uh, four. Point number, and of course for women, there is no ihram in the clothing. For women, there is no ihram in the clothing. They wear their regular clothes. It's only for men. Uh, point number five. Perfume. Perfume as well has been uh, prohibited in the state of ihram. Of course, the big issue comes, how about that which is not intended as perfume, but still emanates perfume, such as soaps, lotions, creams. In my humble opinion, these things are makruh, but they are not haram. They are makruh, but they are not haram. What does it mean makruh? It's best to avoid it. But there is no fidya on you. Why? Because nobody uses soap in order to perfume themselves. Right? Soap is not meant to perfume. So it is not a perfume even if it has some perfume scent in it. You see the difference? Right? Similarly, creams and lotions that are used for dry skin, my suggestion and advice, and this is what I do when I go for Hajj, you buy the unscented versions. You get unscented soap and you get unscented lotions. Right? So to be on the safe side, get that. But in and of itself, to use regular lotions and creams. Now there are those that are extra scented, so obviously this is a gray area here. You're getting more and more to the haram. Right? But uh, the average Jurgens uh, lotion, hand lotion, Right? It has a scent, but it is not scented. Do you see the difference? Right? That's completely yeah, permissible. There's no scent, there's no perfume coming from it. Perfumed lotions are makru. Don't use them. Because, but nonetheless, they are not a fidya because if you wanted to use perfume, you'd put some cologne, you'd put some itr, and that is what is haram. Soap as well, there's a scent that comes from it, but it is not, you don't use soap to perfume yourself. You guys understand this point here, right? So, bottom line, avoid it, but most likely when you go to the bathroom or you go, you're going to find perfume soap over there, right? You go ahead and use it. It's not going to cause you aphidia. It's best that you have your own, but somebody's going to take yours, you're going to drop yours, it's going to go missing. So you go there, there's going to be perfume. Likewise, your skin's going to crack. You, you finished your own unscented lotion. You might have to use somebody else's regular lotion, which has a little bit of perfume in it. There's no fidya on you. There's no fidya if you use that. But make sure in your personal belongings, you have unscented version. This is number six. Number, uh, no, sorry, number five. Number six, uh, yes, go ahead. Toothpaste is not at all makruh because that is ingested or put in the mouth. 
You don't stop eating scented food. Biryani is halal, alhamdulillah, through our hajj. Right? Spicy salah is not a problem, even though I wouldn't advise you for hajj. Very dangerous, but it's not a problem. Okay? So, toothpaste, not at all, not even makru, because that's going inside and, and, and using that. Not at all an issue. Because that's not perfume, once again, and it's going inside. Um, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. It's not a problem at all, but we're getting there. Uh, point number six. Nothing we have to worry about from America. Hunting. None of us hunts when we go for hajj. We don't even hunt in America, so we don't have to worry about that. Hunting is also haram. Uh, point number seven. Inshallah, again, we don't have to worry about from America. Uh, seven, eight, nine, all have to do with marriage. Uh, point number seven is getting married. Inshallah, nobody goes to Mecca in the state of Ihram to get married, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, if you do fall in love, then wait till you get out of Ihram and then marry. Otherwise, yani, just be patient. One week, that's all you have to do. Okay, alhamdulillah. Uh, falling in love in Ihram is not a problem. Getting married in Ihram is a problem. But you should have bigger points in mind. Uh, point number seven. Point number eight is uh, foreplay with your spouse. Uh, and by foreplay, we mean kissing, petting, all of this type of stuff. Uh, we have to be very explicit, I have to excuse me for that, but this is necessary. What we mean is touching your wife with passion. Touching your wife to save her from the crowd is wajib. There's no fidya at all, okay? Touching your wife in order to guard her as all the people are pushing and shoving, this is being a man. There's no fidya at all. Touching your wife is halal, but touching with passion becomes mahdur or becomes what is prohibited. Right? We all know the difference. We don't have to go into detail for this regard. So holding your wife's hand in order that she doesn't get lost is something that you should do as a couple in, in hajj. Holding your hand to be romantic is not something you should do in the state of ihram. This is a common sense differentiation between the two. Uh, so this is point number seven. Uh, uh, point number eight, sorry. Point number nine is actual intercourse and that is separate from eight because eight you can get out of and you pay the fidya for. Nine, your hajj has been null and void. If you get to that level, it's null and void. And to be honest, that's not the, anything you have to worry about because there is no privacy at all during Hajj. Men are all together with men, women are together with women. So there's really, uh, there's really, I've, in the 10 years I've done Hajj, nobody has come to me with this problem because it's not even possible. Uh, even if you go in the superstar packages, generally there's men in the room and there's women in the room, so they don't have to worry about this. So alhamdulillah. Otherwise, just for your fiqh knowledge, this, if you do it in the state of Ihram, this is null and void. Your hajj is null and void. You have to repeat to hajj next year. Big problem, big issue. Uh, just make sure that that doesn't happen. Be patient until you come back out of the state of ihram. These are the nine uh, mahdurat or the nine issues of ihram. Now, uh, one point, footwear. Again, this is for men only. For women, there is no ihram guidelines for clothing. They wear whatever they need to wear. There's no, the same jilbab, hijab, shalwar kameez, whatever they're wearing regularly, they wear in hajj. There's no clothing uh, requirements or issues for our sisters from America. For those who are extra conservative, the issue of the glove and the niqab is something they need to discuss. But I don't see anybody wearing that over here, so we don't have to worry about that. Otherwise, the glove and the niqab should not be worn by a woman as a separate garment. Yes, you have a question? Uh, you don't? Yes. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. Okay. Um, for men, footwear. The Prophet ﷺ said that whoever has sandals should wear them and should not wear shoes. But whoever has shoes, then they are forgiven. In one earlier version of the hadith or earlier hajj, it is said that the Prophet ﷺ told them to cut off the tops of the shoes so that is below the ankles. Right? There's a big ikhtilaf. If you have shoes, must you cut them off below the ankles? Uh, we don't have to worry about the issue because we're going to purchase footwear that we're going to use for hajj. So, what is a legitimate footwear for the men? Obviously, for women, there's no issue. They wear their shoes and whatnot. For, for men, what is a legitimate uh, issue? Again, there's a lot of ikhtilaf. We're going to find details. The bottom line, anything that you would call a sandal is permissible. And anything that you would call a shoe generally is not permissible. Right? So don't wear Nikes, don't wear a shoe. Just wear something that is a sandal. Now obviously there's a gray area and a fine line. Some sandals are almost shoes, you know, I understand that. Yani, use your better judgment, right? And uh, one thing that, uh, as a practical and personal note, do not purchase brand new sandals for Hajj. 
It's making the biggest mistake possible. Use the ones that are the most worn out. Why? Because those are the ones you're used to, you're comfortable in. Right? Don't buy spanking brand new because that's going to make you blisters and sore. No, you don't want that. I speak from experience. You want the ones that are the most worn out and the ones you're the most comfortable in. Right? And therefore, if you don't have any, buy them from now and wear them on a daily basis so that you get used to them without socks. Because you need to wear the sandals without socks. Because you cannot cover your feet. You cannot have the, the socks. Because that, that is a sewn garment. Can we close the door? Maybe so that the kids are playing in the outside. Um, that is a sewn garment. So you cannot have a sock. right? Therefore, purchase sandals that you're going to wear uh, without socks. And get used to those sandals. That is the best thing uh, to do. You have a question with this? For sandals... Uh there's not a problem having it closed from the back. As long as a strap from the back is still a sandal. It's not a shoe. A strap that is in the back is still a sandal. It's not a shoe. Right? I, I myself, the sandals that I wear for Hajj, they are, uh, they are athlete sandals. So, uh, you know, you're supposed to be running in them and stuff. No? Uh, but they are crisscrossed. So that's not fully covered. And then there's a strap at the back. So the bulk of the foot is exposed uh, and there's a strap at the back and there's not a problem at all to wear that. So these are the nine uh, mahdurat or the nine issues of ihram. Now, uh, the bulk of the problem that occurs is with regards to trimming and cutting nails and the, uh, the, the putting on of the perfume and all of this, you know, the trivial stuff as we call it. For these things, if you need to do them intentionally, if you need to do them intentionally, then do them. You are not sinful. And then pay the fidya. What do I mean by this? One of the Sahaba had heavy hair. And in the state of Ihram, while walking to Mecca, he got infested with lice. And lice is a problem. Big problem. Itching, scratching, this and that. When the Prophet ﷺ heard, he said, SubhanAllah, go and shave your hair and pay the fidya. Don't torture yourself. If there is a medical reason that you need to do one of the... So for example, you are freezing cold. You are sick and you need a jacket. And putting it on you is not helping you. Right? Go ahead and put the jacket on. This is for men. For women, of course, they wear the jacket anyway. Not a problem. For men, go ahead and put the jacket on. If you have a fever, you have a flu, you need to be protected from the cold. Right? Go ahead and do it. And then pay the fidya. There's no sin on you. Right. Similarly, any issues of shaving and trimming or whatnot, if you have to do it for medical reasons, there's no sin. What if you did it not for medical reasons, but for uh, uh, any other issue? In this case, comfort, let's say. In this case, you are sinful and you pay the fidya. For medical reasons, you're not sinful and you pay the fidya. For non-medical reasons, uh, you are sinful. So you have to repent to Allah. It's not good that you did it. Uh, and then you pay the fidya. So, uh, there's a fine line between comfort and medical. So, for example, if you have a blister and you need to wear a shoe rather than your... your uh, now, what defines a blister that is really painful? And this goes back to your better judgment. The bottom line, if you think that this is something that is a, a type of medical... Not a darura. Darura is too big of a word. A medical uh, expediency. It makes life easier for you for medical reasons. Then you should do it. And you pay the fidya and you embrace Allah's concession that, look, Allah allowed me to do this, right? Um, another example that some years ago, uh, there was this swine flu or bird flu, whatever happening, right? And so the government said everybody should wear gas, this not gas mask, the, 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 the face mask, right? Because the virus was spreading everywhere. In this case, they should do it, but they pay the fidya, right? Now, I don't know if that is the case anymore. Uh, you know best, or have the government advisory now. The, the bottom line, if you want to wear it for medical you know, reasons, and if there's a pressing need, then there's no sin. You go ahead and do it, and then you pay the fidya. You have to pay the fidya. You never get out of the fidya. What is the fidya? Uh, you may fast for three days. That's very difficult. Much easier, you pay the kafara, which is to feed uh, uh, six people. To feed six people. Right? And then the third option, you actually sacrifice an animal that costs 500 reals, $200, very expensive. You don't need to do that. The easiest thing to do, and they're all three equivalent, the easiest thing to do is to feed six people. What does it mean to feed six people? Couldn't be easier 
any, the easiest thing to do. It's very easy. You go to the shawarma place in front of you, you go to the chicken stand, you go to any type of burger joint, whatever is there, you buy six meals and you will find beggars aplenty. You will find people from all over the world, from India and Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from Africa, from people who can, and they're sleeping, sleeping on the streets. And you go and you give them these meals, and you've done your job, six people and six meals, right? So you feed six people an average food item. What is an average food item? An average meal. Chicken and rice, uh, shawarma, falafel, whatever you're going to buy for yourself, right? Three reals, five reals, whatever is going to cost you, very cheap. And you just go and you buy six meals and you feed six people and believe me you will find much more than six. The problem is when you give it to six, sixty will come and they will say we went as well. So you're not going to have a problem finding six people, you're not going to have a problem finding food. So that's going to be the least of your worries. Okay, you have a question, yes. Uh, back, uh, India, as we say, during those days, or there are people making their problems. You will make your life easier doing it over there, believe me. Where are you going to find six people here, poor people to feed? Right? Where are you going to find sick people in Memphis, poor Muslims to feed? You will make your life much easier. You don't have to do it there. But believe me, it is better you do it there. Before you come back, feed sick people. It doesn't have to be right on that day, but before you come back, you do that. Yes? Yeah, the fasting has to be done. Uh, that uh, fasting should be done in that ihram area, which is why it's very difficult, and I would never encourage anybody to do it. Okay, um, I, we're kind of running out of time. I wanted to have Q and A. Let me just quickly go over the rights of Hajj. We went to spent a long time spending on the nine issues of Hajj. Let me just do in a nutshell the ideal uh, Hajj that you would do as Hajj tamattu. Okay. Hajj tamattu means you will be doing Umrah before Hajj. So what this means is you will enter the state of Ihram, you will be wearing the Ihram, then you will perform the Umrah, which is seven uh, Tawaf, round time the Kaaba, then seven Sa'i, and a Sa'i means one way is one, the way back is two. A lot of people think one way is the whole back and forth, that means you've done 14. No. From Safa to Marwa is one. From Marwa back to Safa is number two. Then Safa to Marwa is three. Then Marwa back to Safa is four. Right? So you do it uh, basically three times back and forth and then one more. Right? So three times back and forth is six and then one more that is seven. Once you've done that, then if you're doing Tamattur, you will trim your hair. Okay, here's where I'm going to be strict with you. This is, in my humble opinion, it is not valid for you to take a pair of scissors and go snip, 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 and that's it. This is not valid. And this is a concession that one of the madhabs has, which I think is not valid at all. When Allah says, trim the hair, you need to trim the hair. How do you trim the hair? All of it. Just like when you do wudu, if somebody said, I'm going to do wudu by going tick, 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 and that's my wudu. None of you would say this is valid. When Allah says, wipe your hair, you wipe your head, you wipe it, all of it. And therefore, this is where I'm strict here and I say, I, you, this is your hajj, do it properly. I do not think this is valid. If somebody else is doing it, that's between them and Allah. If you're asking me, I say, this is not valid. You need to trim all of your hair. And there are barbers everywhere, you know this. At that time of the barber, barber season, barber galore, everybody is a barber there, right? If you're doing tamattur, do not shave your hair during your Umrah, you save that for the Hajj. Because you want to do the better of the two for Hajj. Right? Because within one week, you're going to be doing it again. And your hair is not going to grow back in one week. No matter how much, mashallah, you have, it doesn't matter. It's not going to grow back in one week. Okay? Uh, so you do your trimming. For women, they take their entire ponytail, or their entire hair, as much as they have it, right? And they trim uh, the, the, the tip of a finger. All of it, not just one slip. So they gather all of their hair in one fist, right? And then the tip of it, they would, they would uh, trim for one fingernail. And that is the trimming for women. For men, they have to trim all of their hair. Once you've trimmed your hair, you are out of the state of ihram. This is your tamattu, remember. So you haven't done your hajj yet. This is the umrah of tamattu. Once you trim your hair, khalas, you're out of the state of ihram. So, you go back to your hotel, you take a shower, you perfume, you clothe, you make them do whatever you want, you, there is no ihram anymore, because you're out of it, that's why it's called tamattu. So, once you've done that, you will remain in Mecca. Some groups go to Medina during this time. 
and then come back. That too is fine, not a problem. Most groups remain in Mecca during this time. So this is, uh, Hajj starts on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah. This is most likely the 4th or the 3rd. They will come to Mecca. They'll spend 4 or 5 days. You do your ibadah, you do tawaf, you do whatever you want. That's fine. You're not in ihram. On the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, the only time ever you will enter ihram from where you are. This is the exception to the rule of ihram. Otherwise, if you were to do umrah or hajj anywhere else, or you're coming in, you must enter from the miqat. There's only one exception, and that is during the days of hajj for the hujjaj in tamattu'. That's why it's called tamattu'. You're enjoying. This is the one exception, and everybody will do it, so you don't have to worry about that. On the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, you will re-enter the state of ihram in your place of residence, your hotel, wherever you are, and you say, لَبَيْكَ Allahumma hajj. You enter it again. لَبَيْكَ Allahumma hajj. Right? And on the 8th, your muallim, your guide will take you to Mina. This is the day of preparation. There's nothing that happens there. And in fact, the entire day of the 8th is Sunnah. If you were to skip it, your hajj is still valid. There's no fidya, no kafara, nothing. The 8th is the day of preparation. Yawm at it's called preparation. You're preparing for the big day. So the 8th is not even essential. So if you do anything wrong, you cannot do anything wrong on the 8th. Right? Yes. Well, at what time and during the Fajr time? After Fajr, before Dhuhr, this is Sunnah. After Fajr, right before Dhuhr. So the Prophet ﷺ would enter Ihram in the morning of the 8th, and he would travel to Mina. In Mina, you pray Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and the next Fajr. So now we're on the 9th. Five prayers in Mina. Yes, you leave Mecca with Ihram. From Mecca. Wherever you are, you leave Mecca from Ihram. Yes. You enter Ihram from your place of residence, your hotel, wherever you are. Now, as I said, these prayers and the staying of Mina, this is optional, voluntary sunnah. You should do it. Suppose something happened, you fell sick, you have a fever, stay in your place of residence and make sure you have arrangements to go for Arafat the next day. Keep your energy for the big thing. And that's the ninth. The ninth is the big day. This is the day that is the day of Hajj. The Prophet said, said Al Hajj Arafa. Simple Arabic. Al Hajj Arafa. Simple equation. The whole Hajj is around Arafa. So keep your energy for the ninth day. This is what you need to do, right? On the morning of the ninth, most of you will be in Mina. In fact, everyone should be in Mina, but if it so happens you're not, not a problem. You make your way to. Arafat. And on Arafat, on the 9th, you should aim to get there before Dhuhr. If you get there after Dhuhr, not a problem. But the Sunnah is to get there before Dhuhr. And on the day of Arafat, you will pray Dhuhr and Asr shortened and combined. In Mina, they will be shortened but not combined. You pray two for Dhuhr and Asr, but they'll be at the regular timing. But in Arafat, you pray shortened and combined. Why? Because to show you that on the day of Arafat, there's something even more important than praying at its proper time. And that is Dua. So, Hajj Arafat, this is what you've come, come for. To raise your hands to Allah and to beg and plead and cry and Spend the entire day in dhikr and dua. Dhikr and dua. That's what you, even salah, you just get, get it out of the way. Soon as you arrive, time for dhuhr, you pray dhuhr and asr, two, two, combined. And the rest of the day is then spent making dua, thinking about your past sins, having the intention to Allah to have a better life in the future, and the dua of the deen and the akhirah, dunya, everything that comes, this is what you are there for. And, to, and, and I encourage you, uh, and you know, wallahi, it sounds, believe me, remember this, those who are going for hajj. You're going thinking that this is going to be the spiritual time of your life. When you get there, disease, plague, fatigue, thirst, noise, smog, your spirituality is going to be a problem to try to get out of you, right? It's easy to think, how can I not be in a spiritual state? Get there. See how tired you are. See how physically fatigued. That's the whole point of hajj now. You need to extract the ruhaniyyah out of you, because you're so tired, you just, you know, it's uh, the, everything, believe me, it's a, it's a problem to get out of that. Another point is, 
and it sounds so petty that you might even get angry at me for saying this. You will not believe Hajj has become a, a tourism for many of the people. Talking, blabbering, ghiba, backbiting. Can you believe, and I have seen this too many times, people literally gossip on the day of Arafah. Now you're going to say, not in my group. Mark my words, write it down, in your group. In your group, laughing, joking, talking about... Uh, I have even had people, uh, when I used to do Hajj, there was no internet connection, now I'm sure they even have that. They're listening to the radio for the latest basketball scores. Because there was some game happening, the Lakers versus somebody that day, right? Or one year there was the finals of the football happening, right? And so, can you believe now, people are smoking, doing all of this, yeah, I mean smoking, they don't even think it's haram, so for, you know, it's even worse, and you know. My point being, realize you need to cut off from those people. Don't sit with them. Don't listen to the basketball scores <laughs> that day. You're laughing at me, believe me, you will be tempted on that day. Because that's what shaitan wants you to do. You will be tempted to waste your time in this type of, you know, uh, ghibah and backbiting. And not even ghibah, just talking about stuff of useless time. Cut away from them. The best thing to do, walk outside of the tent to a private area. Shelter. Be under shelter because it's hot. Have lots of water, obviously, practical advice. But just break away from the group. And just sit there with your dua and your dhikr books and whatever you have. And just... Private, have your water and have your dhikr and dua. And spend three, four hours solid away from society. Not meaning outside of the tent, you're on your own, under the tree. Especially before Maghrib, the Prophet would actually come outside of the shade. And he would, in the sun, now this is what time is this? This is two, two, uh, 20 minutes before Maghrib, you know, 30 minutes before Maghrib. Not in the Dhuhr time, it's going to be too hot, right? When the sun has lost the heat, the process would literally go into the sun, out of the shade. Don't do it at 3 o'clock. Do it at 6, 7 o'clock. Whenever is Maghrib, 20 minutes before. So around 6 o'clock these days would be. The process would go out into the sun and raise his hands up to Allah Azza wa Jal directly. And hands all the way up making dua. And you'll see a lot of people doing this uh, in your group as well. And that's the time to do it, right towards the end. You're not allowed to leave Arafat before Maghrib. And you cannot because the gates are closed anyway. So there's not even an issue. Even if you tried to, the police would stop you. Uh, you're not allowed to leave Arafat before Maghrib. After Maghrib, the gates open up. Uh, for most of you, you're going to be sitting in your cars for three, four, five, six hours because there's going to be traffic jams, right? And this is very frustrating. But that's what you got to do. The gates are open, but you are five miles behind the gates, right? And the buses are all stacked up and lined up for five, six, seven miles. Sometimes I have even waited until 11 o'clock before the bus moves. And Maghrib is at 6.30, right? So for four hours, five hours, you're sitting in that smog. And that's the worst, one of the worst parts of Hajj really is that time. Because it's just so much, all the buses and all the people, bathroom is a problem, this is a problem. It's just chaotic at that time. Right? And this is a part of the Hajj experience. Uh, I wouldn't advise you to walk it at that point in time. Unless you're a group of young men then it's permissible or it's good. Otherwise, it's just not the time. Uh, you want to walk it, do it the next stage, which I'll tell you. From Arafat, you will go to Muzdalifa. Muzdalifa is an open plain. There are no tents, there's no hotel. Unless you're a guest of the king, you have a palace up on the mountain. Otherwise, you're all in the open. Muzdalifa is the most disorienting time of Hajj. The most chaotic. It's only six hours. Because you'll get there 11, 12 o'clock. Maybe even 1, 2 o'clock. That's really rare. Usually you'll get there by 11 o'clock, right? What is there wherever the bus is able to find parking? That's where it is. Where do you sleep? Wherever your bus has parked, you just sleep right outside over there. That's the most difficult time of Hajj. Uh, and bathrooms are the worst. Let me get to the bathrooms in a while. But Allahumma sta'an. That is the most difficult time. Some practical advice before I forget. This is the time when the bulk of the hujjaj who are going to get lost, get lost. If it's destined for you to get lost, 90% 90 of the time it will be on this night. Why? Because you wake up and you see 3 million people sleeping out in the open, right? And you see in the distance, perhaps half a mile away, the bathroom. So you got, you're like, straight line from me to the bathroom. 
Okay? Sure, it's a straight line. When you get out after two hours, <clears throat> when you get out, you look and the whole world looks the same to you. Completely. And you're like, hold on, I remember so clearly. So this is the most difficult time, right? You need to be very careful about where you're going from, look at your signs, look at your bearings, everything. Use your common sense, mountains, you know, uh, poles, bridges, whatever you see. Make sure every while you're walking to the bathroom, look behind you and look, look at the area. See, uh, when I come back, what am I going to see? Make sure you look at it, all right? Another problem is you might be using a bus as your uh, guy post, this red colored bus. You come out, there is no red colored bus because it's left. Don't use buses. Okay, use permanent structures, okay, uh, use something that you can see. And it is very problematic, definitely, there's no question. Long lines, 40, 50 minutes is common for the bathroom. And that's why it will come to practical advice, eat little. Eat little, it's, it's going to be easier for you in every sense, right? Of course, drink, you have to drink. Uh, hydration is very essential. Uh, in Muzdalifa, there's a common myth that you have to get the stones. This is a myth. You can get the stones from anywhere. However, it's convenient to get them from Muzdalifa because Muzdalifa is a stony area. But you, you, you know, I, you, I get them usually on the eighth day when I'm in Mina. That's when I get them. Because get that out of the way. You, you, the Prophet did not tell us where to get the stones from. We don't even know where he got them from. We don't know where he got them from. So this is a common myth that you should get them from Muzdalifa. No. You can get them from your backyard in Memphis and go with them if you want. Not a problem. As I said, my, my, uh, I've done, alhamdulillah, more than 10 hajj. My methodology was to get them on the 8th day of Dhul Hijjah in Mina. Because that would get one thing out of the way. So I wouldn't have to worry about it. And the point of advice, have a nice pouch for the stones, right? Plastic bag or some type of uh, pouch. I mean, you don't have to buy a fancy leather pouch, but if you want to, then go ahead and buy a fancy leather pouch. But have something to put the stones in, right? How many stones do you need? Do the math. On the 10th, you're going to need 7. On the 11th and 12th and 13th, you'll need 21 each. So 21 times 3 is? 63 plus 7? 70. Okay, so have these 70 stones and then add 10 fur, just in case. Just in case you drop one or something like this, but around 70 or so you're going to need. Now the Prophet ﷺ told us in an authentic hadith, when Anas came back to him with some nice, big, mashallah, heavy stones, he said, no, this is too big, he said Anas. Something like a chickpea, you all know a chickpea, the tip of your finger, something like this, he said. And do not go to extremes in your religion. This hadith is about the size of stones. So the size of the stone should be small. It's symbolic. Now don't go to extremes. You examine every stone. You put your finger on it. Look, just you have a rough idea. Right? Something that's the size of the tip of your finger. That's all. Keep it like that. Don't get some heavy stones because that's not the purpose. So you get these small stones anywhere. Uh, you want to get them in Muzalifa? Get them in Muzalifa. But there's no reason to do that. And believe me, you really don't want to be spending an hour compiling stones in Muzalifa. Yes, 90% of the hijaj are doing that. You can get on to other things. Okay? So, you'll spend the night in Muzalifa. Uh, you wake up and you pray Fajr in Muzalifa. And then you go to Mina. Here is where, if you're fit and up for it, I would in fact encourage you to walk it. Why? It's not that much of a walk, an, an hour. Um, and when I say young and healthy, I mean women do it all the time. It's just a matter of if you can walk for an hour at a regular pace, that's fine. You know, you'll get there before most of the crowd. It's nice and healthy, fresh air. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's the, the smog and the, 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 the hectic traffic, you'll just get out of it, right? Now, when you get to Mina, point of advice I forgot to mention. Please make a note. Memorize where your tents are in Mina on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah. Memorize where the tents are. Because you're going to come back to the same tents on the 10th. So memorize it. And how do you memorize it? Very simple. Alhamdulillah, all the tents are numbered. All the tents are numbered. And it's rows and columns. So it's very easy. And if you don't know, you ask. There are lots of Boy Scouts, lots of guides there. You say, where is number 3-109? 
And then say, oh, 3109 is that way. And you'll keep on seeing, you look up and you find numbers everywhere. Okay? And once you get to 3109, you'll remember where your tent was and that's going to be your tent. So when you walk back, you know where your tent is. And if you look around, you'll even find big maps in Arabic, but you all read numbers in Arabic. And it'll say where you are, you know, you are here, big arrow. And then you see 3109 where it is, and you go find it. Not a problem, okay? Can you leave Muzdalifah before Fajr? Can you leave Muzdalifah before Fajr? If you are a elderly or a woman or sick, then yes, you may. Uh, and if you're young and healthy, then you should not. The Prophet allowed Umm Salama. Umm Salama was not sick. She was just getting on in years. She's not even old. She's the Prophet's wife, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? She, he allowed Umm Salama to leave Muzdalifa after midnight. And he allowed Ibn Abbas, who was a young boy, to accompany the women because he was with the women. So it is permitted without any fidya, without any problem, for the elderly. So if you have a parent with you and you're taking care of the parent, leave early. Right? Uh, if you have a, your wife who's pregnant, let's say, right? then leave early. Otherwise, if you're young and healthy, so Aisha didn't do that, Umm Salama did. Right? The other wives didn't do that, one of them only. Out of all the Prophet's wives, only Umm Salama. Why? Because she was the slowest in walking, and she was the one a little bit elderly. Not, again, she wasn't old. She's not like in the equivalent of a wheelchair, but she wants to avoid the crowd. So even the slightest excuse, if you have a slight fever, Go ahead, not a problem. From this we derive, even the slightest legitimate excuse, you may leave before uh, Fajr, after midnight. So you spend some time in Muzalifa, and then you move on to Mina. What? We're getting there now. So now this is on the 9th and the night of the 9th. Remaining in Muzdalifa for some period is wajib. You must remain there. If you don't, you have to pay a penalty. And the penalty is the kafara, the sacrifice of another uh, animal. Now, on the 10th, on the 10th, there are four things that are typically done. When you do two of the four things, you are out of what we call the minor ihram. And when you do all four then you are out of the major ihram, right? What's the difference between minor and major, major ihram? When you're out of minor ihram, then you may do everything other than marital intimacy. So you may resume your clothes, your regular clothes, perfume, trimming, all of this is permitted. The only thing that is not allowed is intimacy. And then when you do all four, then everything becomes halal. So what are the four things that are done on the 10th? The order of the Prophet ﷺ was as follows, but this order is not wajib. You may do it in any order. The Prophet ﷺ would number one, stone the Jamratul Kubra, the major, what they call the big shaitan, the Jamratul Kubra, number one. Number two, he would sacrifice. Number three, he would trim or shave. He shaved, sallallahu alayhi wa And number four, he did the tawaf. Once again, you do the stoning of only the one. On that day, you only do one, the large one, right? Number two is the, the sacrifice. Number three is the shaving. And number four is the tawaf. Now, nobody in our times does the sacrifice himself. You just buy the voucher and the coupon. So, you don't have to worry about that. You assume your sacrifice is done. Therefore, if, if the sacrifice is done, that leaves three things. Therefore, when you do one of the three, you are out of? You're out of? Minor ihram, right? Now, on this day, you're going to hear lots of different fatawa. You trust me, this is what I say. Two of the four. Some people say one of the four. Some people say three of the four. This is an ikhtilaf. Is it one of the four, two of the four, or three of the four? Right? In my humble opinion, you do two of the four. And this is what the majority say. In these, this is what the scholar that I'm also following. Everybody, the majority say two of the four. So in our case, once you do the jamrah, right? Then you're out of ihram. Because you can consider that your sacrifice has been done. However, it makes more sense to have your hair shaved before you go back because then you take a nice shower. Just logistically speaking, 
right? Simple logistics. Your hair is going to be shaved. You're going to be feeling dirty. There's going to be some nicks and bruises and cuts. You're not going to pain. Don't worry. It looks, it looks worse than it feels. Okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, uh, and mashallah, everybody becomes a barber on that day. That's the problem, but everybody becomes a barber on that day. Uh, but after the, uh, after the, 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 uh, the stoning, you will find lots of people there. Please note, 90% of them are trimming. You don't want them. You want those who are shaving. 90, if not 95%, are using clippers, right? Shears, like they use on sheep. It's the same thing. <laughs> and when they use it on you, that's a little bit painful, not very painful. But what happens is, they're not shaving, they're trimming. And so you have half an inch or something of a hair left on your head. And to me that's so nonsensical because neither is it a regular trim such that you come back to work the next day normally, right? Nor is it a shave that you get the reward of the shave. You see what I'm saying? Because you want the reward of the shaving because that's triple reward versus trimming. So you need to be careful. 90 if not 95% and it's, you need to search for somebody who's shaving. And of course the sign is they're using the open shave. You know and over there they use the open shave. The, the old fashioned one, you open it up and they put the blade in. Okay, that's the old fashioned one. Point of advice, make sure your guy uses a fresh blade for you. Some of them are cheapskates, right? Or do it yourself if you have some experience, and it, or you do it to each other if you have some experience. And it, I did, yeah. Well, no, if you trim it, then you're trimming it. Oh, you trim and then, shave. Yeah, then you've trimmed and you've shaved. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> then you've trimmed. That's what you've done. It should be shaving. Now, look, I mean, I have done Hajj plenty of times. You will find people. You just have to ask and look around, right? You'll find people, they'll shave it. Once you've done that, now khalas, you are, alhamdulillah, you will be looking forward to the bathrooms in Mina for the only time in your life. Because there you will now take a shower. You will take a shower, use mashallah perfume soap, you're going to feel like a fresh man, and we hope inshallah you're literally now a new baby born. That's what the point is now as well, right? You will feel fresh and rejuvenated inshallah ta'ala, and then you wear your regular clothes, and put your perfume on and trim and whatever you need to do. Now it is legit. And then on the 10th, after that, there's nothing for you to do once you've done the tawaf. You may delay the tawaf. Because if you delay the tawaf, the only thing is you're going to be in the state of big ihram. Right? And there is no privacy that you have to worry about that anyway. Okay? So you may delay it. I usually used to delay it to the very last day. Uh, but again, I mean, once you've done a lot of hajj, you start taking shortcuts. You don't want to do that, okay? If this is your first hajj, you want to do it right. You don't want to take all the shortcuts like I used to do. Uh, aim higher than that. Annie. Once you do hajj for every year, then you start getting a little bit lazy. So you want to do it properly. So maybe on the night of the 10th, when the rush is a little bit less. A little bit, relatively less, because there's never going to be, it's never going to be quiet in that time. Maybe at midnight you go and you do tawaf or something like that on the 10th, or whatever you want to, whenever your group wants to. Once you've done your tawaf, this is your main tawaf, tawaf al-ifada. This is your main tawaf al-ifada that they have. Uh, yani you, uh, uh, you, on the 11th, 12th, and 13th, all you need to do is to stone, right? Now the 13th is optional, by the way, right? The 13th is optional. Uh, what is required is 11th and 12th. But Allah says in the Quran, uh, Whoever is hasty and leaves in two days, there's no sin. And whoever stays for the third day, then there's no sin. So 11th, 12th, and 13th. Now you need to ask your muallim and guide, the bulk of the hujjaj leave on the 13th. They don't do it on the 13th. Sorry, they leave on the 12th, excuse me. Yeah, so they don't do it on the 13th. So if you're not going to stone on the 13th, then you don't need to collect 70 stones. That's if you do another 21. Otherwise, if you're only doing 21 times 21, that's 42 plus 7 gives you 49, right? So how many stones do you need? It depends on how many days you're staying. You guys following this, right? Ask your muallim and group. Most of the groups, they don't stay there for the 13th. Some of them do. And when I've done Hajj, some other groups they stayed, some of them left. So you need to ask your guide. Most of them they leave. Uh, what do you need to do on those days? Absolutely nothing other than the stoning of all three. 
and that's done. Uh, these days it's so easy. Once upon a time this was when the crowds and the mass not massacres, but the stampedes and all that. Now, subhanAllah, I kind of feel cheated. And it, the, the, you know, they're so easy. It's just not, it's not how it used to be. It, it used to be a real jihad to go in that time and that was, you felt hajj. Now it's, they've changed everything. So it's, it's alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, all of this is done. Yeah, it used to be the good old days. You come back bloodied and bruised and everything. You know, uh, so that's on the 11th and 12th. There's only one act left. And that is the tawaf al-wada, the farewell tawaf. Tawaf al-wada, the farewell tawaf. And this is done the very last thing before you leave Mecca. Before you leave Mecca, uh, and if you stay for another three or four days, you do tawaf al-wada when you leave, not uh, when hajj finishes. So tawaf al-wada is the very last hajj. It is allowed to combine the tawaf of the tent with tawaf al-wada. This is allowed. If you're sick, if you have the flu, this might be useful for you. So you delay the main tawaf, and you just delay it until the very end, and then you do it with the double intention. Just like when you enter the masjid, you have two rakat of duhur sunnah to pray, and then you have tahid al-masjid to pray, you say, khalas, let me pray two rakat with both intention. Right? It's jais. So, you can combine the two intentions. If this is your first and only hajj, I wouldn't suggest that. But if you're sick, then this is something, uh, the way out. And with that... The what? You can combine tawaf al-ifadah and tawaf al-wada. Now, uh, the only issue that remains here is what are the arkan and what are the wajibat of hajj and what are the sunan. Unfortunately, I don't have time to get into this, the detailed chart. And this will take us many days. Realize that uh, the arkan of hajj and what is a rukun? If you don't do it, there is no hajj. Okay? The arkan of hajj are very simple. And alhamdulillah, there's really no problem. Number one, is got to be the right time and place. Nobody does hajj in Shawwal, so no problem, alhamdulillah. Right? And nobody does hajj in Memphis, Tennessee. They all go for Umrah. Uh, they all go for Mecca, alhamdulillah. So that's not a problem. Right time and place. Number two, you have to be in the state of ihram. You have to be in the state of ihram. You cannot... What is the state of ihram? Remember, it's to say I'm doing hajj and to make the niyyah. It's not what you wear. If a person does hajj in a business suit, they'll have to pay the fidya, the hajj is valid. You guys following this? A lot of people misunderstand. Ihram is a statement. Oh Allah, I'm doing hajj. Number two. Number three, tawaf and sa'i of the hajj itself, which you've done. The tawaf of ifada, the sa'i, if you've done when you came, that's your, that's your sa'i. Right? Tawaf and sa'i. That is the rukun. And the most important rukun is arafat. You cannot... Make up if you don't do these things. Just make a list of this. Everything else, you can. You can make up. If you don't spend the night in Muzdalifa, if you didn't stone, all of this can be made up. How do you make it up? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. The one mortal sin of Hajj, which you don't have to worry about, is intimacy. That nullifies the whole Hajj. Otherwise, apart from that, you cannot do anything that will nullify then uh, the hajj, realistically speaking. With this, I'll open the floor for Q&A. Um, yes? Isn't that the uh, tawaf and sayings part of that? But when you are mentioning it, when we have a new of Umrah, we have to do the tawaf and sayings and the tawaf and sayings. See, this is, uh, you should not do multiple Umrahs. Just do one umrah in the beginning. You should do extra tawafs. Oh yes, tawaf is done without ihram. Yes, yes, yes. Look, log on to the YouTube tonight and see tawaf. Most of the people doing tawaf are not wearing ihram. Tawaf is an independent unit of worship. You do tawaf wearing your regular clothes. It's like tahiyat al-masjid for Mecca. For Mecca, the tahiyat al-masjid is the tawaf. So, and of course, you cannot do it every time you enter because it's too busy. But if you come in the non-peak season, three months later, five months later you go, you do as many tawafs as you want. Okay, yes? So, uh, getting there to Mena, you know, you, you must be there in Mena on the 10th and 11th. Some people come from Mena and 
come back to Makkah and stay there. Yeah, so this is where we get into the ikhtilaf of what is the minimum amount of staying in Mina. You don't have to stay in Mina during the day. You just have to do the, the stoning. So f nobody says you have to stay in Mina during the day. Once you've done your stoning, you can go to Mecca and sit there for five hours. Ikhtilaf comes when you come back, what is the minimal quantity you need to stay in Mina? And here's where you're splitting hairs here. Um... Yani, if you stay the bulk of the night, which is, means from Maghrib till midnight, you're safe, inshallah. So you stay more than half the night in Mina. Most of you will have your tents in Mina. So you don't have to worry about this issue. Some groups have fancy hotels in a place called Aziziya, which is outside of Mina. Right? This is the rare. Most groups, they stay in Mina. You don't have to worry about it. For those who have hotels in Aziziya, the issue comes. I had a number of Hajj packages like this. We would literally go to Mina in our buses and sit there for five hours and then come back. You don't feel like Hajj. You're copping out. This is a trick out. You know, it's not good. Stay in Mina like the Prophet did is better. Yeah, but it is wrong if somebody is outside in Aziziya. Oh yes, this is wrong. You have you've missed Mina, and then you need to pay a fidya for that. Yes, yes. So if you have a hotel and you just go take a shower, you, then I'm not a problem. You need to spend the bulk of the night in Mina, right? If you want to go to Aziziya in the daytime, there's not even a, it's not even makru. And if, no, no, that's you can spend the whole day in the hotel. That's not a problem. Because what is required is you spend the night in Mina. That's what's required. So if you spend the whole day in Azizi and the air conditioned hotel, not a problem. If you have the coupons for those, uh, there's no worry that if they, the slaughter actually happens after you've written There's no way you can find out. There's no way. So the scholars say you assume your qurbani has been done. Because in fact, the fact of the matter is the qurbani will continue for five days after hajj. They have to sacrifice 30 million sheep and goat. It is statistically humanly impossible to sacrifice that many, you know, at one location, you know. So don't worry about it. Assume yours has been done and Allah knows, Jani. You know. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I've heard that some groups actually take uh, in Hajjah from Makkah to Arafat on the night of the day. Yeah, I mean... So the question is, taking the hujjaj on the night of the 8th, there's nothing wrong with that per se, but they've given up the sunnah. Right? As I said, the 8th, all of it is optional. If you cancel the 8th, and on the morning you go to Arafat, you're fine. So if they go to Arafat the night before, they don't have to even pay fidya. There's no kafara, nothing. Because the 8th is preparation. Tahiyyah, it's not the real hajj. Uh, I just missed one point, but uh, all, uh, when you do, you sacrifice that's your minor Iram is uh, Yes. So uh, when you do all four of them, your major Iram is also finished, or you still have to wait for the next two days also? No, then you're finished. Your major Iram is finished. So once you've done the Tawaf, basically, in the Tamattu' case, right? Because the Tawaf is what you delay. All the rest you do right then and there at Mina. Once you do the Tawaf al father, then you're out of everything. Other questions? Yes, good. I mean, it's permissible. Uh, doing multiple umrahs is not what the Prophet did. The purpose is that you go there, you pray in the haram, you do tawaf. He would do multiple tawafs. He did more tawafs than we can count. He would do multiple tawafs in a day. So the notion that we have of doing multiple umrahs, it really is not in the spirit of our religion. Umrah is one per journey. That's the sunnah. And I speak from experience. When you do it that way, you actually feel spiritually better. Because all of your energy is dedicated to that umrah. When you go for three umrahs a day, you cheapen the umrah. Right? You make it like a rich a habit. You don't want to do that. You do one umrah, you feel spiritually this is the umrah. Then after that, you do as many tawafs as you want. Yes. But you normally 
coming back again, then you will be around again. Are you doing tamattu'? No, then the, when, you've, when you've done the umrah in the months of hajj, and the months of hajj are shawwal, dhul qa'da, dhul hijjah, right? So if you go after Ramadan to Mecca, you are in the months of hajj, okay? So if you've done umrah on the first day of shawwal, this counts as your umrah for tamattu'. As long as you don't come back to your home, there are hujjaj, by the way, from Indonesia, from Egypt. They do the four-month or three-month, mashallah, hajj, the way it used to be done in the good old days. Your father must have done those hajjs, right? They go and they stay in Mecca for two months, three months, and Medina. So if they do it in that way, if they were to arrive on the first of Shawwal in Mecca, that is their umrah for hajj. And they do the Umrah, then they get out of Ihram, and they're completely out of Ihram. And they stay, they go to Medina, they come back, and then on the morning of the 8th, they then enter the Hajj. Is that clear? Yes. Go. When you're doing Sa'id, and you go to Safa, and you stand there and you say, mm -hmm. uh, you do that three times, right? Three times and in between them you make your own dua. Yes. You make dua in between them, not say it three times. Then. No, no. You, so there's a dua uh, that is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari and others and you should look it up and memorize it. But this is sunnah. If you don't do it, it's not going to affect the hajj. But you should do this. There's a dua that the Prophet would make uh, facing the Kaaba on Safa and on Marwa. And so you say this dua and then in between he would make his own duas. Then he would say the dua again. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha He would make that dua. Then he would make a dua of his own. Oh Allah, give me the good of this world and the next. And then he would say the dua three times. So that's three times a specific dua. And in between the three, there are two gaps. And in these gaps, you make your own personal duas. You do that at Safa, at Marwa. Safa, Marwa, Safa, Marwa, Safa. And then when you get to Marwa for the seventh, you just walk away. Because you don't do the dua when you finish at Marwa. Which is why I said theory is one thing and practice is another. However you do it is fine. Yes, life is more important than than this. So when you finish at Marwa, you just do the dua three times. No, you don't even do anything because you've done you've done them seven times. The dua is done before you begin, not when you end. You understand me? Think about it. From from the Kaaba, you're going to go to Safa, right? And when you're at Safa, you make your first dua. Then you start walking, number one. Then you get there, dua number two. Number three, four, five, six. When you start your seventh, you make the dua. When you finish the seventh, you're done. What is the ritual when you finish the seventh? Cutting the hair. You don't make the dua at the seventh. Okay. Yes. You are worried about this issue. I'm telling you, you shouldn't be worried about it. It's not going to happen, especially because you're so worried about it. Then you'll remember to do it. I forgot to say before. Until you landed in Jeddah. No, even if you said it right before landing, you're fine. But nonetheless, if you forget to enter, <sighs> because, mashallah, you want to be perfect, I would say you should hire a cab and go to the Miqat, drive 30 minute distance, not that difficult. It's going to cost you 20, 30 bucks, not a big deal. You tell the, the driver who want to go outside the closest Miqat, so he'll drive there, and then you enter Miqat and you come back in. This is going to be the best for you. If you're with the package, which you're going to be, and you don't know how you're going to get there, this and that, in this case, you need to pay the penalty uh, of entering the ihram after the miqat. And the penalty is another sacrifice, which is $200, $300, you pay the, the penalty, the fidya. Okay, yes? Uh, is it sunnah to make the dua putting on your ihram when you go on the uh, in Habis, like, to make the intention why you're doing it, is it or just if you think? No, 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 because that in Habis and Habis, that's when you're outside of Makkah and you don't know if you're going to get to Makkah. 
right? Once you're in Mecca, I mean, you are there, so uh, it would not be in accordance with the Sunnah. But if you were to make the condition, then then you are scot free. If you miss tawaf al wada, but you have done tawaf al ifada, if you are a woman whose monthly cycle has started. Yeah, so if you miss it, but you've done ifada, then your arkan have been done. But you should pay a fidya, a sacrifice, a hadi for that. Because that is a wajib that has been left. But it is excused for women in their monthly cycle. It's excused, so they don't have to pay the fidya. But in your case, this is not, this is, no, it's not excused. So you should pay a hadi for that. A few more minutes left, yes. When you make the tawaf I mean, is this the time literally your bag should be tied ready to go soon? So realistically, when you make tawaf al it's not in your control. And the driver will tell you, for example, be ready at 4 o'clock for the tawaf. Finish, right? And uh, you'll probably finish because you're a mashallah young man, you'll probably finish by 2.30. Because he's going to time it according to the most elderly person in the group, correct? Right? So you're going to start with everybody else, and you should. You don't want to delay it because you don't know what's going to happen. And you're going to finish by 2.30. You're like, well, now what do I do? You're going to go and sit. You're going to get a shawarma to eat. You're going to get a drink. Because it's beyond your control. The point being, you should not delay it except for a reason beyond your control. Right? So you should try to have your bags as much packed as possible and have it ready to go. And then do it uh, the latest possible. In the real world, it's not in your control. So you do what you can as much as in your control, and inshallah Allah will forgive the lust. And have the full intention. So you should have your bags packed, everything down. But when you do come back, you're going to have probably three hours to kill. But that's not in your control. Right? You didn't intend that. And by the way, he's going to say four o'clock, it'll end up being six o'clock. This is the way Hajj is. It's very frustrating. Very painful. Yes? See, the point is doing shopping, luxury shopping, indicates that you knew you'd have time to spend after Tawaf al Wada'a. It's not Tawaf al Wada'a. And therefore, the only shopping that is permitted without any karaha is the shopping that you need for the journey. You need to buy water, you need to buy drinks, you need to buy food to eat on the way. You cannot buy food and walk into the haram, right? So this, you just buy the provisions to go, not a problem. But to go shopping for souvenirs, it shows that this wada is not wada in your mind. So this is the problem. Yes, or if it's beyond your control, you just sit there doing dhikr waiting to get out. But Allah knows you've done your job. Okay. Yes. No, no, no. You visit your friends, then you do wada. What is the meaning of wada? Goodbye. Right? Literally, that's what wada means. And the purpose of wada is you say your farewell to the Kaaba, to the house of Allah. So the meaning of wada, the last thing that you do is the wada. That's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> yes. Uh, this goes back to the saving of the year or Some people who say that you should not have such a state of the Yes, this is one particular madhab. There is no reason at all to prevent somebody to shave your hair if he's in the state of ihram. This is uh, being strict for no reason. It is allowed for him to shave your hair, even if he cannot shave his hair, because you're the one getting out of ihram. There is no problem in him shaving your hair. Yes. Or else there's going to be the issue of who's going to be the first to trim the hair. 
right? The chicken or the egg. People make religion more difficult than it needs to be. There is no such prohibition whatsoever. This is one of those... Yes, yes. Not a problem. Final question. Going once, going... So there's a uh, weak tradition, in fact, very weak tradition, that says that whoever prays 40 prayers in my masjid uh, with takbirat al-ihram, you know, my shafa'a will be wajib for him. It's not an authentic tradition. At the same time, what's wrong with it? You want to pray 40 prayers there, then alhamdulillah. It is not a requirement of hajj at all. It's not a requirement of hajj. And therefore, if you do it, it's good because you're praying 40 prayers in Medina. Alhamdulillah. Extra reward. If you don't, then there's no problem at all in doing that. Uh, it's not even sunnah in my opinion. The hadith is so weak that it doesn't even... Even if it were slightly weak, we say, okay, khalas, bismillah. But the hadith is close to being fabricated. Nonetheless, what's wrong with praying eight days straight in the haram? Nothing's wrong with that. So, not a problem. Inshallah. With this, inshallah, if there's any questions that you guys have before you guys leave, email me or see me in the masjid, not a problem. Uh, but my advice to you is choose your religious authority when you're on your way there. Uh, and then stick with him. Do not ask multiple people. Hajj is very complicated. And the more people you ask, you're going to get 10 different fatwas, you're going to get confused. And Allah knows you're trying your best. You go to the shaykh you trust, you ask his opinion, end of story. Don't ask 20 times, because it's not the time to learn fiqh during hajj. Right? Then, uh, I forgot to mention some practical advice. Obvi obviously, uh, spiritual advice is you should already know this. Ikhlas, always have dua, dhikr, do this for the sake of Allah. Intend to return a different man or a different woman. This is the main point of hajj. You come back a different person, right? If you resume the same lifestyle, then you haven't done hajj properly. You know, it's the whole point. Hajj is mean, means, to, means to be a, a changing point in your life, right? You come back a different person. If you're not praying five times a day, you need to start praying. If you're praying five times, you start praying the sunnah. If you're praying the sunnah, start praying the nafil. You know, extra Quran, extra. There's got to be that commitment. I'm going to be a better person. That's the whole point of hajj. All uh, the spiritual stuff aside, practical stuff. Number one, always have money in you, with you. All the time. Always have cash, right? Reasonable amount. At least 100 reals. You don't need that much. Number two, always know where you are. Wherever you are. Mina, Muzdalif, Arafat, Take a bearing. See where your bus is. Memorize it. Number three, do not leave the group unless you have to. It is always best to stick with the group. Okay, always be with your group unless you have to. The only time I tell you to go ahead and do that is from Muzdalif at Tumina on the morning of the 10th. It's actually easier to leave the group and meet up with your group in your tents because you know where your tents are, right? It's the only time where if you're young and mashallah, you have an hour to walk, go ahead. Uh, also, by the way, if you are up to it, the best hajj I ever did was the walking hajj. It's wallahi an enjoyment of its own because when you're walking, you're away from the smog and the traffic and you're with the human experience, right? So if you're able to be brave about it, when do you do the walking hajj? Basically from Arafat on the 9th. Arafat to Muzdalifah is a long walk, two and a half hours. That's the long walk, right? Arafat to Muzdalifah is two and a half. Muzdalifah to Mina, hour, hour and a half. Very easy, not a big deal. So if you want to do that stretch, believe me, you will enjoy it much more. Because the walking hajj, as soon as the sun sets, khalas, you put your backpack, right? Your water is with you. Another practical advice, always have water. Always have water. Drink plenty of water. Do not get dehydrated, right? You have your backpack with you. Food is everywhere. There's people with shawarma, shawarma, falafel, ice cream. Excellent. You have beautiful memories. No smog. That's the best part of the walking hajj because there's a special road for the walking pilgrims, right? No traffic, no buses. To me, the worst thing of hajj, number one, the bathrooms. La hawla la khusala billah. Right? Number two, the smog. I cannot stand the smog of those buses. It, gets, it used to get me nauseous and sick. I hated it. Right? 
If you have fries, I said you wear it and you give the fidya. But the mask doesn't protect you fully. You still get the smog. Which is why my best hajj was the walking hajj. On the day of Arafah, you just have the backpack. You're ready, you're up for it, you're enthused. Yalla, bismillah. You start walking. You're never going to get lost because everybody's heading in one direction. <laughs> you're not going to get lost that day. So you walk. When you get to Muzdalifa, you're all alone. You don't have to worry about the bus. You find your place. You have your, ba you have your sleeping bag, right? You have your sleeping bag with you. You have your inflatable pillow. You have your water uh, uh, canister. Khalas, bismillah. You have a light dinner packed. You have your dinner, you go to sleep, you wake up, and then you work, you, you work uh, your way to, uh, to Muzarifa, uh, uh, to Mina, excuse me. And that's really beautiful. If you can't do that, at least do the Muzarifa to Mina walking, if you're able to. And if not, then yalla bismillah, stick with the group. Yes, Muzarifa and Mina, you know, they're very nice walkers, very wise and nice. Uh, even between Arafat and Muzarifa. Yeah, believe me, you're not going to regret it. If you're able to walk an hour, an hour and a half, you're not going to regret it. From Muzdalifa to Mina, there's a huge walkway, shaded, there's no sun at all, you have no problems, water everywhere. As I said, you even get ice cream. Not a problem. It's a nice experience, Annie. You see, I like ice cream a lot. So, nice experience, not a problem, inshallah, with this. Even if you're in a haram, you can eat flavored ice cream. Yes. Not a problem, alhamdulillah. Uh, and of course the final point, please remember all of us, uh, especially your teachers who have taught you about Hajj, uh, the Muslim Ummah, uh, every, please remember them on the day of Arafah is the day when dua is accepted. Have extra sincere dua for everybody and uh, inshallah may Allah accept your Hajj uh, and may Allah allow us as well to do plenty of Hajjs in our lifetimes. Wazakumullah khair wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بحبات الرمال وأكثرا صلى عليك الله ما غيث هما فوق السهول وبالجبال وبالقرى فوق السهول وبالجبال وبالقرى